Hi, I'm from Calibarts. I started uh, recently at Autodesk, and I'm working uh, on Autodesk circuits. Has anybody of you heard about like Autodesk 1 3D circuits? Uh, OK, yeah, a few of you. I saw you guys last week. Uh, but anybody else, it's new, so that's great. Everything I'm going to tell now will be amazing, new, and fantastic. Um, so um, because the theme of the evening is Belgium, uh, I'm going to uh, first uh, explain how we went from like a small Belgian startup to a uh, Outless product. And then I'm going to talk about the technology behind uh, Outless circuits. And hopefully afterwards in the Q&A, you guys can tell us if we're doing things right or if we should change things. Uh, but since uh, most of you are unfamiliar with this um, uh, tool, I'm going to start with uh, showing you what you can do. So here's a, um, an example that I pulled from our website yesterday from one of our users. So we have a tool uh, that allows users to uh, prototype, breadboard, design, and actually manufacture, um, or go to manufacturing uh, of electronics in a browser. So like completely online, you can breadboard uh, Arduinos. Uh, you can add like LEDs, motors, and everything. You can program them in a browser and develop. And then once you're done, uh, once you're done breadboarding, once you're done uh, prototyping, you can actually move to the physical phase, and you can uh, you can do schematic design, uh, PCB design, so actual layouting uh, the tools. So in this example, I'm now writing just uh, some code. So I'm writing something to the, the serial output, and then in just a bit, uh, I'm going to start a simulator. And so now this whole thing is being simulated in the browser. In your like nothing is going on on the server. It's all in your browser. Um, so Afterwards, once you're happy with your breadboard design, virtual breadboard design, you can uh, move on to schematic design so you can look at the actual how are things connected. Then once you're happy with the schematic design, you can actually move on to the, uh, the PCB layout so you can actually do the physical layout of what your board should look like. And once you're happy with this, so once you've put, out, uh, put all the copper traces where they should go, you can move to the manufacturing phase. So you can uh, generate all the files they need to send to manufacture, and they will actually ship you uh, your electronics board. So that's all the circuits. But before it was all the circuits, it was actually called Circuits.io, and it was a small Belgian startup uh, by uh, these two guys. So Benjamin and Karel, uh, they started uh, back in 2012 at Ghent University. Karel was a, uh, was a postdoc working on FPGAs, and Benjamin uh, was a professor of computer science and my PhD advisor back in the day. Uh, so Carol actually realized that there was something wrong w or something that couldn't be improved about the, the business model behind uh, normal software design for electronics. So typically, you have four entities that are uh, concerned with uh, electronics. And that's like, you have your consumer who wants this product to be built. You have a designer who's actually going to like put everything together and like lay out the board. And then the designer has to order it from a manufacturer. And in order to uh, create this design, he needs tools. So he needs EDA, or Electronics Design and Automation Tools. And um, this all seems very nice. The problem is uh, that, in practice, it doesn't quite work as nicely as we expect it to do. First of all, the designer uh, can have a hard time finding customers, because he, uh, I mean, Obviously, the consumer wants like a really nice designer, a really good designer, uh, but the designer needs to be able to put out his portfolio somewhere, so uh, we need some tools to be, to be able to show our designs. Then the designer needs expensive, at this point, very expensive software to actually design uh, his, his boards. And then he needs a way to communicate with the manufacturer, and um, the manufacturer usually has trouble understanding the designer. So there's lots of communication going, going on, which makes things expensive. Uh, so what Circuits.io tries to do is actually to uh, make things simpler and uh, like allow those, com those entities to talk to each other. Um, so um, we put ourselves in the middle. Uh, the consumer can use our product to see which designs are out there. So you can go online, see all the public designs, and uh, yeah, make comments and, and so forth. Designers can upload designs, can, can actually design in our tool. And then manufacturers can easily get the files they need from our tool direct directly. Now, um, this was all developed in Belgium back in 2012 and 2013. And then uh, I think in February, February 2013, uh, Autodesk called uh, Carol and Benjamin. And um, a few months later, acquired uh, this product. So 
what happened next is like they rebranded all these concentrated circuits. And what happened next is that uh, lots of uh, new tools and capabilities were added uh, to the product. So we are now able to like fully uh, simulate Arduinos and you can breadboard um, in the tool. So here's a small example where we have uh, an Arduino hooked up to, um, to a motor connected with a potentiometer and you can like completely in your browser test out this fully mechanical electrical design. So um, you can look at the code, you can, um, you can look at the uh, oscilloscope and see what's actually going on if you were to build uh, this design. Um, uh, another thing uh, that was added is um, CircuitScribe. Uh, so CircuitScribe is, is a technique where you use like a conductive uh, pen where you can just like trace uh, circuits basically yourself. Uh, on a piece of paper, and you just put modules on there, and by putting everything together, you just get a fully functioning circuit. So you'll see this in a bit. So these are just basic modules, like uh, one is a motor, one is a potentiometer, and now we're connecting the design, and this will take a bit. Um, so we're just doing a virtual breadboard design, and then we can first test it. So we're going to Yeah. We're just finalizing the design, and then at this point, we can just run the simulation. Uh, and again, you can just test the whole thing just in your browser. And the cool thing is, because it's circuit scrap, you, the only thing you actually need to build the circuit is a, a pen with conductive ink. You can actually just print it at home, draw the circuit like this, and in a few seconds, you'll have a working uh, product or, pro or prototype. Cool. Uh, so, um, well, this was all like uh, two years ago, so now at this point, we also have more cool stuff going on. Uh, so, um, what happens next is that uh, the team moved to the United States. So, uh, in October 2014, uh, four people moved to uh, San Francisco, so Carl Benjamin and two designers, Tess, who was actually supposed to uh, present tonight, uh, and Valentin moved to, uh, to San Francisco. Uh, Yella stayed behind in uh, Belgium. <laughs> and uh, at this point, the, the team has actually grown quite a bit. At this point, we are about 13 people in San Francisco and Kent combined. We have eight Belgian people and uh, four <laughs> Americans. I joined very recently, about two months ago, and, uh, but I've been in touch with the project for the last two years. Um, so, Outdesk has actually been uh, pretty good to uh, CircuitsIO. Uh, since uh, Outdesk integrated it into their uh, suite of products, we've actually grown to about 500,000 users. Uh, we have 100, over 120,000 PCBs, like physical layouts have been done in the, in the product. And we have uh, over 1.4 million circuits, like schematic designs, that have been uh, built in our tool. So, it's catching on quite a bit. So. What are we doing next? What's the, what's the future? So one of the cool things is that out there's, there's lots of products that incorporate 3D. So uh, uh, a neat thing we're developing now is uh, called Project Wire, where you can actually develop electronics in 3D. So you see it here, completing your browser again, you can just um, take a piece of material uh, and draw conductive traces to it. And you now have uh, various, uh, you actually have a few uh, 3D printers that allow you to build a combination of conductive traces and uh, plastics. So in this case, we're using the Voxelate, which is um, uh, an electronic 3D printer. So you can just afterwards just send this to your 3D printer and get this circuit made. So uh, uh, yeah, you can do a download G-codes, and you get the files you need, and you can just send it to the 3D printer. Um, anyway, so um, let's talk technology, because I tried to keep this part to go a bit fast because it's all like the background, uh, but tonight it's about HTML5. So what is the technology that we're using to make this uh, possible? Um, I've selected a few topics uh, that we're using quite extensively um, in our product. So we have first have model view state machine instead of model view controller. Um, we're using ShareJS uh, quite a lot. It's now called ShareDB. Uh, we're using Node.js, of course, everybody does. And finally, we depend quite heavily on SVGs. Uh, so 
let's start with MoleView state machine. Uh, I guess most of you are familiar with typical MoleView control setup. Uh, in our case, we actually replaced the controller with uh, a state machine. Um, so it's, it does exactly what a controller does. So it sends, uh, it modifies the model, uh, and it gets events from the, from the view. But we are using a state machine because it allows us to uh, figure out exactly what's going on in our product. So the state machine uh, triggers on specific events and will execute specific codes when there's a transition that can become active. And uh, that allows us to actually record what's going on in the user. So if, if a user tries something and he stumbles and like, he cannot like, reproduce something or he cannot like, advance and he sends an email like, oh, well, I got in trouble and this doesn't work, we can actually re retrace all the steps and we can figure out what's exactly going on. So this is uh, quite a great tool for Q&A and so forth. And um, it also allows us to figure out if there are behaviors in our software that should not happen. Like we cannot like have two, uh, uh, two, trans two transitions that are active at the same time. So uh, the state machine is actually like just a very stringent uh, controller, but actually in the end works out great. We can observe everything that's going on. We can also add undo and redo functionality and so forth. Um, well, the, the model in our case is actually split up in two parts. We first have uh, data. So this is actually what you normally see as, as what you would consider your model. So it's the persistent data. And in our case, uh, everything that we put in the data is actually uh, shareable, undoable, and undoable. So we can, um, if you have two editor instances, everything gets synchronized. So you can do collaborative, edi collaborative editing, as I was showing a bit. And everything is also undoable, which allows us to actually uh, make sure that everything is, is um, uh, like every action you do, you can go back in time. If you have two editor instances, one can go back in time and or to the previous actions and so forth. And we can just keep everything consistent, which is very important if you're making a big design. You don't want to uh, make a thing that won't work in the end. You want to make sure that everything you do uh, can be repeated and can be undone. And uh, on top of the, uh, the, the actual data, we also have an interaction model. Uh, this is uh, all, here we store all the things that are, for example, if you are zooming, this is everything that's important to interaction. So if you're, uh, if, you're, um, if you're using the tool, everything that's like the current state, but doesn't define what your product will actually do. Um, yeah, um, so <coughs> model view controller becomes model view state machine, and uh, it allows us to actually have a very clean uh, approach, and everything can be very... Uh, easily observed and tested. Uh, next to this, we also have uh, sh shared JS. So this is, uh, does anybody know shared JS or shared DB? It's one guy, yay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which happens to be the previous presenter. Uh, yeah, so um, shared JS is, is, um, is a JavaScript library that allows you to actually take a JSON document or, or, uh, or a piece of text and, and actually synchronize it. You can do operational transformations on it. So you can say, like, oh, we'll change this piece of text. And then uh, you have another editor open, and it will try to keep the JSON or text consistent between multiple uh, documents or multiple versions. So um, for example, if you're just like collaborative editing, you have like one uh, text editor and another one here, and people are typing here, like in, uh, uh, for example, uh, let's say, um, yeah, there's some, I think Google initially did this for their Google Wave. Uh, where you have like collaborative editing, or even Google Docs, you're editing and um, somebody else editing, but then your your internet connection is kind of like slowish. Uh, you still want to make sure that everything is consistent, and you still want to make sure that you don't break undo and so forth. So, uh, Shared JS allows you to do this, uh, and the way it does this is actually by um, by using operational transformations. So this is just like a, a, a way of describing how you change documents. So in our case, we are keeping a big JSON documents, which is the state of the editor consistent between different uh, clients um, if multiple people have the, uh, the editor open at the same time. So the nice thing is that once, once you implement this, collaborative editing becomes very straightforward. So I have an example here. I should load now. So I have just have two windows open. And uh, so I added a small uh, a pad on the left. It showed up on the right. And now I can change the properties on the right. So you see it actually changed on the left as well, but it hasn't updated the view yet because it's for performance reasons, it will only update if your, um, if your uh, browser window is active. So you can see here, I will actually give a, this is quite a nice example where we draw some uh, pen trace in our editor. 
Uh, and so we draw, we've drawn it on the left. We're done here. We go to the right, show it shows up now. And we can now do the undo actually on the right side. So this is actually just communicating only the changes. So we're not exchanging a huge JSON document. We're only communicating the small changes between those two letters. So we have, very, we have a very small amount of data that needs to be exchanged, and it's uh, quite efficient. Additionally, everything is versioned, so we can go back in time. Because in electronics design, you typically, once you're working on design and uh, somebody else wants to use your design, he wants to use a particular version. He doesn't want to use the latest version. Uh, the latest version. He wants to use the version that he imported into his design. So it's very important to have copies or versions of every single uh, state uh, in your design. Can I ask a question? Sure. But the, uh, if you've pulled in the change, uh, then it will be the last one that was shown. If, of course, if your internet connection is out of sync, I mean, let's say you stop, let's say you go offline. Uh, yeah, so the question for the video is actually that, like, what happens if you draw a rectangle on the right and, and a triangle on the left and then do undo? Um, well, it depends. If it's everything in sync, then everything should stay synchronized. Uh, Otherwise, because you're using operational transforms, transformations, you're actually guaranteed that it will stay uh, consistent. So they might both disappear. It's, uh, yeah. I think you can also try this in Google Doc, where you actually have one that goes out of sync, and then the other one, you have sometimes it's like a bunch of text disappear. But everything in the end stays consistent. That's the whole point where we're going into this like very stringent framework. Um, yeah. So. Obviously, we're also using Node.js. Everybody's using Node.js these days. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we're using, everything is actually living on the client side. Everything you saw in all those examples, everything was happening on the clients. Um, so even the simulator, everything was just like being completely simulated in your browser. All the electronics, uh, it was an analog simulator in your browser. The only thing that was exchanged was actually that uh, to the server was the, the code. We, we, we sent the, the Arduino code to the, to the server to compile using the standard Arduino compiler and then send back the hex file. Uh, of course, our backend, we have a backend, a, a REST API for data storage, which, which connects to uh, uh, Memcached for cached assets, cloud search uh, by Amazon for um, finding the assets, assets through metadata. Um, and then we have some other proprietary uh, storage for uh, the user data and the main assets, so the, the, uh, the content. Uh, we do use some isomorphic JavaScript. Uh, we actually render all the thumbnails on the server. So we just basically what ha what's happening uh, is that we take our full editor, we just load it up on the server, and we use a, a fake DOM. In our case, we're using a JS DOM. We're not using any React or, um, or Angular. So no uh, war. I mean, we don't have to discuss if we're using React or, <laughs> or Angular. We're just not using any of, of those. Um, we're actually using JS DOM, uh, creating all the SVGs, and then just grabbing them and storing them all on the server with exactly the same code as we're running on the clients. Um, this brings me to my final topic, which is SVG. So um, everything you saw, except for the 3D view, was SVGs. Uh, all the others are rendering to SVG, so we make uh, quite a lot of use of SVG. Um, we heavily use uh, transforms and groups. So every object is actually um, is in an SVG group, which actually directly references the raw object, uh, the raw data object in our um, in our backend, so we can easily figure out where things are going wrong. Um, on top of that, uh, I want to actually end with like what you see is what you get. So in our case, the SVG is kind of the ground truth. Uh, the rendering uh, you see in your browser should actually be what gets built. So I've added an example on the on the bottom left where you get the um, the PCB design as you see it in your browser. Then there's the manufacturing view, so those are the files you send to the manufacturer. And then on the, um, on the middle picture, you actually see the final uh, PCB design. So this is actually the circuit that was built there. This is just a test like with a very weird shape, but you can actually, so you get exactly what you design our tool, you get it just shipped to your home, which is uh, what it was all about. Um, as I said before, what we're currently working on, uh, we are uh, adding 3D views. So there's a small example on the on the bottom right, so you will be able to like see your product basically in 3D and integrate, and hopefully soon also integrate other tools, so you can actually build a full uh, prototype. Um, 
while I was going over my slides and attending the previous talk, I also found out that we're actually doing something correct. We're actually apparently using SVG icons. So we're doing things, at least some things correctly, <laughs> according to the, <laughs> the previous talk. Um, yeah, uh, and that's, that's it. So uh, I'd say try out our tools. Uh, you can just use them for free online and build something. Thank you.